and I have nothing else jumping in at the moment. I thank you all. Okay, let's get started. Uh, again, I'm Steve Sargat, the director here at the Small Business Development Center, and uh, welcome everyone to Chris Tripoli and phase section two of his five part series. Going to go through the best of menu practices today. So, Chris, uh, I'll let you have at it. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Appreciate it very much, Steve. I appreciate everybody's time. Good afternoon. And um, you're right, today is our second in a five part series. We really, really appreciate everyone's participation uh, last week and hope that you'll be staying with us as we go forward to talk about other things, managing numbers, your finances, marketing, and so. But today, we're going to talk about menu. And as I said earlier, it's always fun to talk about menus. It, it, menus are, um, are basically how we tell our story. Uh, sometimes people wait too late to really pay attention to how they want to display their menu. Um, or we don't realize until later that where we put items on our menu makes sense uh, in how people are going to read, where their eyes are going to go, what they're going to remember, and what they're going to think of our concept. Um, there's many, um, um, many rules basically about menuing and we're going to try to touch on everything and I'm going to give you some specific examples of what COVID has done to small hands-on independent operators in the area of menuing and how we've had to pivot and I'll give you some uh, examples of some people in various communities on what they've done and how it worked for them. Uh, if at any time, remember, if we're talking about something you'd like to explore further, or maybe it makes the light bulb blink and you think, hey, this is something I've got a question about, uh, type it into the chat room because we wanna make sure <clears throat> that before you go, uh, we can address any of those questions. There'll be time at the end for us to revisit issues and answer questions. But getting started, I'm sure everyone would agree that whether you're here because you have a limited menu um, counter service concept, or you have a mobile food service concept with a, a menu that hangs outside your truck, or you've got a um, full service menu that's presented at the table, um, that, that you'll agree that the menu is more important than just simply a list of what you're serving and how much what you're serving costs. It's really the heart of the concept because the way your menu is accepted sets the tone for your operation, sets a tone for your product mix, for how long things are going to take to cook, for how expensive your food cost is going to be, for the type of service, for the type of portion control. Um, it tells the story, sure, of who you are, how you want the concept to be remembered and what you offer but it also sets a tone for how we're going to operate. It also is responsible for creating the revenue that's needed. Um, and if it's properly laid out, properly cost, it has a dramatic effect on our profit. So <clears throat> there's not really another area of the restaurant operation that touches on so many things. That has the marketing element to it, has the impact on daily operations, has the impact on revenue and profit. Um, as well as how we're going to operate, where we're going to store things, what we're going to be ordering, how long things are going to take, um, and how we're going to serve them. So that's welcome to the menu. Even though we all have them, no two menus really have to be alike. Menus are displayed differently. Um, menus are passed out differently. Colors, font, uh, size, style dictates to people that are reading the menu a lot about the formality of the concept, the expense of the concept, the amount of menu items that the concept has. So that's kind of the overall comments and we're gonna to touch on every one of them. <clears throat> Currently right now, you've got three, I think, distinct different customers and they have to be menued differently. Right now you're serving three types of customers because COVID created that. We have what we'll call the dine-in, the regular, the people that have been motivated to return. They feel comfortable returning. They're, they're in your restaurant. They, they, they've been longing for what they call that regular normalcy. So uh, they had a hard time adjusting to just eating to go or cooking all the time at home. 
Um, so menuing to them uh, means you know, that they'll adjust to today's sanitary concerns with limited capacity, uh, with table separation, with sanitary issues, wearing a mask when they're walking around and not eating. They'll adjust to that. So that's customer number one. Customer number two, however, are the people that are your curbside pickup customers. Um, they're reacting very well to delivery. They are, they've adjusted to doing more to go, pick up. Um, they want their menu curbside, convenient, quick. Uh, third party delivery is okay. So what, what we have to do when we menu to them is remember value and convenience. That's the second customer that COVID has kind of given us. Um, and then the third is sort of the unready, the, the person who's still stuck. Um, they, they need to be reached out to. We need to gain their confidence back. We've got to re, um, we've got to regain confidence that they can be convinced that dining in or purchasing more takeout uh, is important. And so we market our menu differently to them. Dine in, curbside pickup, and sort of the unready. More than likely, that third category is getting less and less. As time goes on, there's less people sitting on the fence and more people that have either adjusted to pick up and take out at their favorite restaurant or even gone a step further and said, I'm ready to dine in once in a while. COVID-19 has been tremendously challenging um, <clears throat> to us for the menu. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's made us, um, I think, better to serve. Um, if, uh, and it's, it's been it made us challenge ourselves to adjust our menu simply to survive. So there's four steps that I've seen most restaurants take uh, through COVID to adjust and to maintain current business and have a chance at increasing revenue. And the first step was one of definition, sort of reconfirming their menu strategy or redefining what menu items are going to work due to COVID. So think about that. Have you already been through that? Have you already gone through defining if I have less volume, customers aren't visiting as much, how do I wanna fit into their customer habit today? Because it's changed. They're either still gonna dine in or they're gonna do takeout or they're stuck on the fence doing nothing. So how am I going to be able to redefine my concept to get offerings that work for them? So they order for me and not somebody else. The second step is adjusting our variety. Most restaurants have limited their menu items due to less revenue and due to what items might travel better, what items could maybe be packaged and family packages better because those seem to be wildly accepted during COVID. So we've got defining or reconfirming the image that we want in our menu. We've got looking at limitations of our menu, uh, rethinking our variety. And then the third step is packaging. Packaging has gotten very creative with menus. There's a few restaurants out there that I know have done a very, very good job in trying to repackage their menu offerings, taking single servings and making uh, a duplicate uh, servings for two because it's curbside pickup. Taking some of their common items that people have really longed for and packaging them or taking items that they're buying from their purveyors and putting them into takeout packages. So you're getting small, you know, jar of honey with a menu item that you're ordering, or you're getting um, somebody's lavender ice cream, you know, that you buy as sort of an extra in, um, in the um, uh, menu package to go. So repackaging and getting creative has had something to do. And then the fourth step is how we're going to present this. If we're going to re reconfirm our image and we're going to maybe limit our menu, and we're going to get creative with some of our packaging. Now, how are we going to present it? Because where we place menu items, how we design the, the layout, um, how we round our pricing, um, how we define uh, where we place and how we box and how we shade um, says a lot about what we'll sell. Those are the four steps. And we're going to talk about all four today. So the first step in defining what's gonna work best on our menu. Some of you have probably already done this. If not, I strongly suggest that you sit with one or two of your key people and take a look at your item sales reports. Since COVID, 
What have your daily item sales reports been saying? Some of you might refer to these as your PMEX report, but it's basically the product mix. Your customers are talking to you every day. Even if they're not verbally talking to you, they're talking to you every day by what it is they order. So uh, you'll see patterns. Don't you see patterns by looking at your item sales reports? What menu items are selling during the week versus the weekend? What menu items sell basically at lunch versus dinner? What menu items sell better to go? What items don't sell to go at all? So in order to define or reconfirm our image, we have to first start with what we know guests are telling us. And then we can play to our strength. Okay, the more we listen to the boss, that's the customer, the, the, the smarter we get. There were all kinds of stories uh, that we could share about people making mistakes. And typically it's because they were making decisions that weren't really based on what the customers were telling them. And um, large companies, for example, have made horrible menu decisions when they are basing things on their thinking or the way they feel they're reading the public on not taking a look at a customer trend. Probably the, the biggest one, some of you might remember, um, uh, a, a concept that started years ago called Boston Chicken. Then it became Boston Market. Y'all remember that? Boston Market was in, um, at one time was really a major player, hundreds of locations. Uh, and then they started assessing what they called uh, the consumer buying habits. So I was very interested in that. I thought, let's see what they're learning. What they learned was most of their most successful restaurant locations were in areas where very popular brands of fast food were. So some of their busiest stores were, say, maybe next to a Taco Bell or a Popeye's Chicken or a Church's or a McDonald's. And they thought, you know, the only thing that fast food seems to be very, very good at that we just don't have as a part of our Boston market concept is the value meal. You know, we don't seem to have the value. Meal. Maybe we could get a lot of extra customers in and raise our revenue if we you know, created a value meal. So that was their thinking. They did a lot of research on that, but it was all in-house. They did some studies on what kind of value package might work, uh, what size uh, of chicken, how many pieces, type of sides to order, what would be the right price range, how should it look, how should it package. So there was an awful lot of research, there was an awful lot of training when you have that many stores. There was some changing even in equipment. Then there's a lot of marketing. So millions were spent to inform people of how we're going to increase our revenue by getting extra customers in, by changing our menu to add our specials. And our specials are going to be the value meal. So. We can learn from this because what happened to them, those of you that might remember back then, what happened to them was they heavily promoted this value priced meal where you could get a piece of chicken and two sides and it was a lower price. And what they wound up doing was successfully reducing their sales by about 10% across the board. So they spent a lot of time, a lot of energy and a ton of money so that they could wind up lose revenue so it led to disaster. Executives lost their jobs. Company eventually went into Chapter 11. McDonald's put them, bought them out uh, of, of Chapter 11, has been operating some of the units since most of the units are closed. Now, maybe we can't trace that failure all to that one boardroom decision. But I do like to make that as an example of how small, hands-on, operators can be smarter because we make our decisions closer to the boss and the boss isn't the boardroom the boss is the customer so the, the customer is talking to you every day make your decisions based on what it is you are play to your strength do more of what you see working when you do your menuing now had they listened to those three statements know who you are stay close to the customer and play to your strength they would have realized that their customers didn't look at them as fast food their pricing was higher, their quality level was higher. So um, they didn't get more customers like they were hoping because of the value meal. All they did was give their current customers more choices and people chose the lesser expensive choice. I was one of them. I remember going in and I would normally get my two piece of chicken, I'd get my side dish, but they were promoting this value meal and I thought, hey, why not? So I was part of the buying public. So they misunderstood who their customer was 
Instead of playing to their strength, they went outside the bounds, they modified the menu and they lost. So I can't say that strong enough that what we want to do when we talk about menu is stay close to what works. Look at your item sales reports and it's going to tell you that if the customers are, say, ordering more of the things that are off of your grill or more of the items that are fried or more of the items that are seem to be priced in the seven to $9 range. then that tells me that when I develop new menu items or I wanna package items, I wanna make sure that they're priced within the range that's already established. I don't necessarily wanna push the envelope and I certainly don't wanna lower it. If I know that there's a price range that's very, very well accepted. So anyway, we listen to our customers, we read our item sales reports, and that's how it, we can make much smarter decisions on what to do. Assess your item cost. How often do you really update your item cost? This is something that you can do re pretty regularly with your prime vendor. I suggest at least two, three times a year, you know, maybe seasonally, four times a year, it'd be good to just talk to your prime vendor and go through those main items on your item sales reports and update the cost so that you know exactly what it cost me to make those items. OK, so we got to assess our item cost, tell our story, because our story is basically not just an item cost, but it's in the margin that we make. Because remember, it's the gross profit that goes to the bank, not the cost percentage. And I say that because some of you might be selling a lot of items that might have a higher cost uh, percentage than others. It's not everything on your menu, for example, is going to be a 31% cost item. Uh, if that's your target, you might find some items cost out a little less. Side items cost a little more. I'm never really afraid of the higher percentage cost items when I menu with a client, as long as it's priced correctly. Think about that. I mean, if you've got a $12 item on your menu, but it's a 40% cost, you still have more gross profit, more money in your pocket left over than if you've got, a, say, a 30 or 31% cost item, but you can only charge seven or eight dollars for it, right? So, so you don't make your decisions only on cost. That's, that's one of the key items, but only one. And we're gonna talk about the other couple too, because it's, it's, it's not just item cost. So hopefully we've already dispensed with a couple of myths when we talk about menu. And that is um, that more is better, that item cost rules, um, and uh, because it isn't necessarily the case. Um, or that more specials bring in more customers because specials might mean packaging, might mean value, not necessarily cheap. That's not necessarily a special. So let's move on from defining. So let's say you've, 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 you've been re-excited now by analyzing your menu and you knew that you were a particular type of restaurant, a casual Southern style full service restaurant. So you know that people are really ordering those good homemade sides that little bit of bacon grease that's in the skin on mashed potatoes and the fact that it comes with the, the meatloaf and the chicken fried steak and a few other things. And so what can we do then to keep some of those key items alive and maybe develop some other items that fit into that same price range and can fit in with the same uh, dishes and side dishes? That, that's your challenge. So um, also when you do that, you probably found some duds. The more you did that, you probably found, well, they really like these sides and they really like this item and everyone really likes this um, uh, dessert. But if we're really honest uh, and we look at our item sales report, we're also going to pick up some that people aren't caring very much about, you know, what I call the duds. So even though you might really like them, the customer's the boss. We're the owners. <laughs> the owner isn't necessarily the boss. When it comes to menuing, the owner is the one who's got the final decision making and the one who's carrying the responsibility, but the customer is the boss. So the more we listen to them and the more we take ourselves out of it, we'll adjust the menu to what works. And we'll find that we're going to have uh, a new definition of variety. Because before today, you probably thought that variety meant more choices. And <clears throat> customers don't necessarily react to more items as variety. Different things that you do with your prime items create variety. So just having more items doesn't necessarily mean more variety. It's not how much of what you have on the menu. It's what you do with what you have that's on the menu. So um, take chicken, for example. If you've got a really good grilled chicken club sandwich, 
It isn't that important to have eight or nine more chicken sandwiches if you have just two because you have two or three more that are very unique and special because of the way you do a Cajun seasoning or a Hatch Chili Southwest or something. So it's what you do with the chicken breast that's most important. It isn't the how many. So um, I think that's really, really important. We learn that lesson by watching some tremendously successful chains teach us that. Uh, uh, there is a Texas-based chain um, um, that uh, is full service, upper casual. Um, you, they've been around for, gosh, I don't know, 30, 40 years. The, they're called uh, uh, Houston's. Some of them are, are now changing to an upgraded concept. I think they call it Hillstone. But in any event, we would receive tremendous reviews of their menu because they get high marks for variety. Yet when you look at the menu, the menu is pretty limited. You know, it isn't one of those really big three pagers. It's really pretty limited. It's just that every area has something special with what it is they're doing. So they may not have nine burgers. They may only have two or three, but they're very unique and special. And they still have chicken. They still have pork. They still have pasta. They still have beef. They have one or two vegetarian items. So they touched all the bases. So remember that when you review your menu, that variety is touch the bases, do something special to create a point of difference not just the amount. So maybe there's just one or two items of pork and three items of chicken and just a couple of pastas and three or four home style items made with beef. But as long as they are unique and high quality, people will still find that they can get what they want. That's what people used to say. They'd always go to Houston's because they said, I don't really know what I'm hungry for, but I know I'll find something. I might want to eat something light. Well, they've got good salads. I might want to eat uh, something heavier. I'll get the rack of ribs. Uh, somebody else in the party wants pasta. Somebody, so you, you'll find what you want, but yet there's only like 30 or 40 choices on the entire menu. And that includes appetizers and sides and desserts. So that's the variety. That's the definition. Think about packaging. Some of the winning uh, restaurants that have done really, really well are creating new combinations with their core items. So if you learned on your item sales reports that you've got a core item and it is maybe a particular steak and you wanna do more grilled items because of that, well then I would say take that steak to see how you can combine it to create a, um, a special package or maybe they get that steak and um, they get an appetizer at a half price to share with the table or they get more um, uh, interest because they can get a small portion taster dessert by ordering what's popular. So you're trying to raise interest, you're trying to play to your strength, you're trying to raise revenue, but with, without you know, going overboard. You can do that by packaging. So value meals really are basically a new way of packaging. Um, value meals don't necessarily mean it has to be cheap. I mean, there are restaurants that have these business lunch packages where you get a small portion of this and then a popular lunch and maybe a half portion of a dessert. And it might be 10, 12, 15, $16. There's value in eating that way. But, but that's not like going through the drive through and getting a, a value meal or ordering something off the $2 menu. So remember, value means packaging that is interest and building it around something people already like so they see value in ordering that doesn't necessarily mean just cheap. Um, I think um, COVID has really, really reacted well to coming up with specials, taking items that are popular and then making them special on a day, a meatloaf Wednesday or a mountain of wings Saturday or um, you know the fish fry Friday, making these larger portions so that people are buying them and taking them home because they're doing meals for two. Um, or family wing night, or uh, rack a rib for you barbecue guys instead of just um, you know the uh, the two meat combo with a side. People seem to be reacting pretty well with that. And then another thing on packaging is upgrade the kids menu. Uh, restaurants, especially in COVID, knowing that more people were ordering for the family at home, have used this as an opportunity to include the kids menu as uh, menuing from their concept. So it isn't like we were years ago where we just thought a kid's menu could just be, oh, I don't know, those um, take out of the freezer thaw corn dogs 
or just chicken nuggets that are out of a package. Uh, now what's happening is people are expecting that if they're ordering from you and they're getting a good package and it's third party delivery or it's curbside pickup, that the kids that are at home should be eating something that is maybe more in keeping with your menu. So, you know, small stuffed potatoes are very popular coming from delis. Barbecue, mini barbecue sliders for kids. I've seen very popular, small little, you know, chopped beef sliders, um, uh, obviously smaller burgers. The idea of having something that fits in with that concept uh, seems to be very popular. So don't just throw on chicken nuggets or corn dogs if you're selling, um, an Italian concept. How about a small mini kids pizza? Just a little miniature um, wood fire pizza grill is doing this very, very well in Alexandria, Louisiana, where every pizza item that's to go, they're doing the small little kid size pepperoni and it's helped increase their sales for family takeout. So those are some of the things that I think seem to be working. Some examples um, I've seen throughout Texas, I've seen people through COVID doing new menu packages where um, like say taco restaurants doing taco kits where kids can then build their own tacos. Um, I talked about that pizza example where you've got the mini little kids pizza. Um, there's a upper casual restaurant that's gone really, really wild by taking some of their popular items that were on their menu and offering them to go, but a slightly larger portion. So it'd be dinner for two. And this was because their restaurant before COVID had virtually no takeout business. They were a, or still are, they are a more of a French bistro. So it's upper casual, a lot of wine, a lot of champagne. Um, and most people were eating in small groups, twos, threes, fours. So then COVID comes, smacks them and they go, how are we gonna menu for success now? Cause dine in is very restricted. Uh, those three customers, remember, only some are ready to come to dine in. Some are on the fence, not coming or doing anything. And then some have adjusted very well to getting restaurant food and eating at home. So how are we going to succeed when that's the customer behavior? So they looked at their menu and they decided, here's what we'll do. We'll try to make packages that are for dinners for two so that the two people that were usually coming in will now get their favorite items oversized that they can take home and eat. And because the state of Texas, as well as some other states, many other states, started allowing um, alcohol to be part of a to-go package, they would, they would find a pretty good pairing of wine or champagne that would go good with that popular item. And they decided to roll that in just at cost, much like grocery stores do with milk. It was the loss leader. And they tell me that they had great success that way. And, and their logic was, our dining room isn't open. We have all this inventory anyway, bottles of wine, white wine in the refrigerator, a wide variety of champagnes. So it's not like costing us any more. If it helps us sell more food to go to roll it in and all we're doing is covering our costs, then we'll win. So there's no labor involved in it. Um, there's no extra overhead. So we won't charge our regular price. So now what happens is they started marketing these dinners for two, that had a um, appropriate wine or champagne that went with it. Uh, and they had an increase in their takeout sales from say maybe 5% of their revenue pre-COVID to 50 to 60% of their revenue post-COVID. It was all in menuing. So how did they market this menu? You know, directly to their current customers. They were just emailing to their current customers. You're not coming in, but our food is available. We still have our uh, mushroom meatloaf Tuesday, or we're still doing our seafood taco on Wednesday, or we're doing our whole red snapper with this white wine on Friday. You know, things that based on their item sales mix worked were now packaged for two and it included wine. So I stayed close to them to talk about how well that was working because this was to me was a bit of a gamble. Uh, they weren't really doing takeout at all. And now they were doing so much takeout and it was all because they, you know, they successfully listened to their guest. They selected a limited menu. They cut out other items that weren't necessarily gonna package well. And they came up with a menu for curbside pickup delivery only.
And they'll sell anywhere from 50, 60 or more of these packages every day. And like I said, now they're doing 50 to 60% of what used to be their total revenue, curbside pickup and third-party delivery. So is that tremendous? Uh, not necessarily. Would they love to have their old volume back? Well, sure. But when you have an economic model that's operating a much lower uh, uh, level uh, menu, you've got fewer people in the kitchen. They have no front of the house for this. There's no extra host staff, no dining staff, a couple of runners to go out to the curbside. And this menu has been very, very successful that way. I, I've been following a very high-end restaurant. For those of you who are listening today and you're maybe in the community and you're more the special occasion high-end restaurant. Um, uh, I, I talked a lot with the Brennan family and Alex Brennan and Carl Walker explained that they were really, really hurt when it came to how to remenu due to COVID because Brennan's in Houston um, really only existed for special occasion dinners, high cost, very pricey business lunches and private um, events, tremendous amount of banquets, all the things that we couldn't do now. So COVID comes and what happens to their menu? There is no banquet menuing because banquets are closed. They have to cancel everything. Um, there's very, very little opportunity for lunch, especially since they have limited capacity and most people are working from home. And special occasion dinners are being rethought. So their volume has been drastically cut. So they wound up coming up with a menu of how they could just take their key landmark items that people know are well branded for them and make them available for to go and pick up their shrimp and grits, their bread pudding, their turtle soup. Um, then starting to work with HEB, um, our Texas-based grocery store, thank you for them to be promoting local restaurants. In most of their markets, they have reached out to local restaurants to bring some of their key items into their commercial kitchen to make and to represent them in the grocery stores. So you, you now have a really, really uh, unique menu package because you can go to an HEB and find Brennan's uh, turtle soup or Brennan's shrimp and grits or um, a Brennan's um, bread pudding. Um, a, a husband and wife team were very, very successful by repositioning their menu following the steps that we just talked about um, when their sports bar closed. Um, this is in a small um, town outside of San Diego, California. And they told us that they had this popular sports bar. So COVID comes and smacks them upside the head. And they thought everything about our concept is what we can't do right now. Because, you know, sports bars are all about gathering and you're eating and you're sharing plates and you're watching 30 different TVs and you're drinking and you're yelling and screaming and all the things that of course can't be done. So they thought we're gonna analyze our menu and pick just our five or six key items. Our, and there were some burgers and uh, some barbecue ribs and different types of spiced wings. And they said, we're gonna have to create interesting packages to sell the sports bar atmosphere, the Monday night football package, the Saturday extra wing uh, college uh, package, the Sunday football barbecue package. And he found the same thing. He said, by marketing to my existing customers and selling items that I know they liked anyway, but by oversizing the portion so that, you know, we get a good price and they're getting food for two or food for four. He said, then I found that we could actually survive because we have no front of the house expense. We have a very small kitchen staff to do this, a couple runners to do curbside pickup. So if we're only doing 50 to 60% of our total revenue, we're actually maintaining a better profit margin. And it was all because they menued by those steps, you know, pick the key items that represented their concept best, package them in a unique way that reeked of value, getting more for a fair price, um, uh, limited the scope of the menu. Remember, variety isn't more items, variety is just the key items that represent different things. So you still have some pork and some beef and you have some burgers and you have some salads and you have some wings. So, but you didn't have to have that many. So um, by following those steps, they were able to have a, a winning menu program. And we don't have to go that far. Um, I talked with the uh, La, uh, La Luncheonette in Belton, Texas, because they were talking about how they took items from their menu and by making them special on certain days. Uh, and over portioning them, they wound up getting a tremendous amount of curbside pickup for people to feed the whole family. Um, and they were doing very little to go business, 
before COVID. Um, so this, they took their popular tacos and just did a Taco Tuesday only. They did their uh, diner items, their blue plate specials, and they would rotate that on Wednesday called Way Back Wednesday. Uh, I think they did either taquitos or tamales on Thursday, fish basket Friday. Uh, and then every Sunday was family dinner, the whole pieces of fried chicken with chicken and homemade mac and cheese and things for kids. Um, you would order the big chicken dinner and the kids menu was free. So these were all menu items, but by doing certain menu items on certain days, they were able to engage with their regular customers and get people to order from them on multiple days of the week. And thereby taking what was really a non-existent takeout program pre-COVID to again, about 50% of their total revenue. So it's all in the way they were menuing. Um, I think there was some daily special combinations and an awful lot of package to go and a lot of value pricing that helped a seven unit Cajun chain succeed. They're based in Houston, it's called BB's. Um, BB's uh, is a uh, Houston based casual full service restaurant. They face the same issues that most of you were facing. How am I going to take the main items of the menu? How am I going to maintain quality with less staff? How am I going to promote this menu? And how am I going to be successful with, um, uh, with COVID and with you know, less dining? Um, and even though dining is coming back and we are at a higher level of inside dining, um, the customer behavior still isn't back. So um, how many of you have either gone to the restaurants or added some of these um, popular essentials to your takeout menuing? Because there are some restaurants that did very, very well by packaging things like paper towels or sanitizers or gloves, masks, um, and they would do that with their to-go packaging. And this was very, very important because it gained a lot of uh, positive results early on. Now, early on, meaning, you know, last March, April, May. But I know of a couple of restaurants that have now shifted because now it isn't as important, I know, for sanitizer or masks or, or bleach or toilet paper um, to, you know, to, to rush and find. Uh, we're finding those a little bit more regularly now at the grocery store or wherever else you go. So, but a lot of restaurants that I know haven't let that go. They're still doing extra surprises. And this is where you can menu some of your local suppliers and put that in your to-go package. Um, maybe there's a particular honey that you get at a small bee farm. So you can promote that ant bees honey, or you can get a special hot sauce that, or a special barbecue sauce that a local uh, small purveyor supplies to you. And so now what you can do is if it's a, your barbecue Thursday, a small bottle of that sauce can go in uh, and um, that helps make your to-go package uh, have an additional point of difference than others. So maybe the essentials aren't that important anymore, but the idea of putting something in or offering something extra really is. That's a really good curbside or third party uh, menu technique that COVID has taught us. Okay, so let's leave that point for now, defining, costing, um, rules on variety, and all the packaging for COVID. Let's talk about some basic menu practices um, that have to do with design and layout. Because whether your menu got smaller or whether your menu is say the same size, how and where you place items, how you describe items, even where you put the price on the menu, um, sends messages to your customer. So I'm going to share with you some of the current practices um, and, um, uh, and some of the results from those practices that I've seen. Um, area placement, let's first start by categorizing your product and placing it basically where you want to get more attention. So if you have a menu that is on the wall, above the counter, stationary, or maybe it's a drive-through board, Okay, or maybe it's hanging on the outside of your truck. It's a stationary big menu like fast food, like counter service. Knowing that by separating those in sections and that the middle section and the section to the right get looked at twice as often as a section to the left might tell you what, where you wanna put the items that you wanna sell the most. Um, 
for those of you that are dealing with handheld menus, um, and even though you may not be using very many of them now, you might just be using a short one menu per table due to COVID, or you might be doing the scan menu. But when you do go back to the regular two page, you open up and hold menu. Remember that people were gonna look more to the right and the upper right quicker than they do bottom right and the left section. So doesn't that stand to reason? Think about that now when you're not working in your restaurant, and when you're a customer in some other restaurant, think about where your eyes go. And, and that's why maybe some items that people don't necessarily care if they sell too much are either on the bottom left or bottom right, but they're not the center and they're not the right or they're not top right. Like if I was an Italian restaurant, for example, and my sales mix told me that I'm really more of a grill, I'm selling more seafood, more grilled chicken, grilled steak, veal chops, and expensive pastas. Well, then you're going to see those in the middle and on the right. Now, I might still be selling um, appetizers, minestrone soup, calamari. Sure, that'll be on the left-hand side. Maybe I even sell pizza, but I don't sell very much of it. And I don't necessarily care if you don't come here for the pizza place. So my pizza might be on the bottom left. See what I mean? And so those are just general directions that you might want to think about when you're laying out your menu items. Now, here's one that most of us maybe don't think about, but it's been proven time and time again that specific menu items within a category get more attention if they're listed on the top and listed on the bottom of the section than the ones in the middle. So if there's particular, say, a poultry section and or maybe it's all entrees, and if there's a couple of particular entrees, that really tell your story or that are very popular or that have the better profit margin, you might wanna put them on the top or on the bottom rather than listed somewhere in the middle. It isn't important at all to list your items according to price. So, you know, when people open up the menu, it isn't important to say entrees, it starts at nine, then 10, then 12, then 14, and down on the bottom are six, is the $16 item. The prices can be all mixed up. What's important is that you're placing the items that you know have the better margin or that you just know tell your story better and you wanna sell more on the top or on the bottom. The next point about menu that I think is really, really important, whether it's you know, COVID related or not, are, is how to describe your menu. Um, it used to be kind of uh, in vogue, so to speak, to have long descriptions. So if I had a menu item and if it was my stuffed cabbage, it would be my Auntie Anne's recipe of sauce and marinated this and rolled meat and stuffed with rice and blah, blah, blah. In other words, I would tell the story and the whole procedure. OK, um, however, now you're going to notice most of the most successful menus are basically simpler. What's the main item topped with what served with what? So if you've got what you might call chicken Monterey and it's got uh, hatched chilies with melted cheese and it comes with, a, with cilantro rice, then we say that, you know, it's grilled chicken breasts topped with uh, cheese and hatched chili served with cilantro rice. And guess where we put the price? We don't put the price in the price column anymore. You put the price right at the end of the description. So does that mean that the prices don't necessarily line up? Absolutely. But it also means that people are going to be shopping by item, not by price. And it also tells the price as part of the story. I'm giving you this, topped with this, served with this for this price. It makes it part of the story. It's so much better that way than just having, um, the item, a long description, and then a price over here in the column. Just works better. Just remember too, the use of little boxes around items call attention, shading behind an item that is a house special or that's the everyday value meal, that's very, very important. And then lastly, you might wanna make sure that you're pricing to round up because people don't necessarily remember the difference between say 969 and 975 or 985 and 999 for $10. It rounding to the closest quarter, or as you've seen, many restaurants now are just charging either by the dollar or by the half dollar, 9.5. That's $9.50 or 10 for $10. 
instead of 989, 995. Just rounding to that closest, say, quarter is a very safe thing to do. And you start noticing that those extra 10, 11, 14 cents that you're gathering is a small revenue increase when you're talking about the hundreds of people that you're serving or thousands of people that you're serving per week. And that extra might help cover the additional paper costs, for example, because your to-go business is now doubled or the you know increase in um, napkins or portion packages. That's where we get that. So there is one other thing too on menuing that is that I've seen is that the menu has driven people into new markets. And that's going to be possible. It's possible. Where will your menu take you? Uh, catfish Parlor, a two-unit fried catfish fried shrimp restaurant run by two brothers in Austin. One's on the north side of Austin. I think the other's on the southeast side of Austin. Uh, they now have their family recipe of jalapeno uh, tartar sauce sold in, I don't know how many HEBs and in all of the Bucky's now. And this was something just because the customers kept asking for extra jalapeno tartar sauce. So they took that menu item to a commercial kitchen. They learned the process of nutrition analysis, proper packaging, jarring. And before you know it, they were able to start distributing um, a popular menu item that is a, a base of their uh, concept. Um, it, you might think that that's kind of out of your reach, but it may not be. The, in the Bryan College Station area, Melissa and Rolf Lawson have a small kolache counter called Kalachi Rolf. It's kolaches and some other bakery items and coffee. And I think they have two units, but they noticed that so many people weren't just buying the item with the coffee. They were buying the bags of six and 12s. So they started marketing those bags to other places. And um, that led them to the suggestion of going into a commercial kitchen. That led them to discussing how to uh, do these things frozen um, and how they might be able to last. They did product testing. Well, anyway, long story short, they're in 118, I think, HEB store uh, at, at, at last count. Uh, and they're now being sold through uh, Cisco, um, the central uh, Texas Cisco, I think, that uh, delivers to Austin and San Antonio, is selling this product to mostly um, assisted care facilities and to school systems. So sometimes a particular menu item that is very popular for yours may have uh, a whole new direction for you. It's possible. So, so in summary, menu reviews are very important to do. We talked a lot about COVID's impact on your menu. But even once we get a little bit more into normalcy, even when more people are vaccinated, even when more people are comfortable dining back, even months from now when dine-in is busier and those people sitting on the fence are no longer on the fence, some of these practices are still gonna be around. People are still gonna be looking for convenience. People are still gonna be looking for a good package deal. They're still gonna be looking for more curbside. Um, and you're still gonna wanna be reviewing your menu seasonally. So review your menu, update your item costs, and remember menu review means play to your strength, question items that aren't selling. Remember, menu review means variety isn't adding items. You might be taking items off actually. Uh, menu review means a redesign with those design principles of placement, shading, bolding, price columns out, prices in the descriptions, lengthy descriptions out, short to the point descriptions in, so, so those are just basically some of the principles that I think are going to outlast COVID. They're basic menu principles, uh, and uh, they'll work for you whether you're doing a small, inexpensive counter service restaurant or whether you are the more sit down, um, full service, high end um, banquet room restaurant in your community. Thanks again for participating today. Uh, don't hang up, don't run away. Let's take a look at the chat room. Let's get to some questions if there are some. Let's see what we got here. Anything, Wendy? Uh, there is a question about if this recording um, is going to be available and the recording really belongs uh, to the SBDC. Uh, I, I'm not sure how you guys want to address that if it's going to be posted on your website for people to see at their leisure? We're first going to distribute it to all the folks that registered today. 
So everybody that registered will get a copy of it. Excellent. Okay. So there you go. Now you feel pretty good that you didn't have to really take notes. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry if I talk too fast for getting uh, getting the note taking, but yeah. I just think this is a wonderful opportunity. Uh, and these are topics that I love to talk about anyway. And the fact that your SBDC is going to have this recorded and uh, available for others and available to play um, mm -hmm. at, at some other time in the future, uh, it's yours. So hopefully you can use it. And please remember now that if you're going through this in the future and it rings a bell and you want a little more assistance, um, contact uh, the SBDC, talk to one of the advisors, they'll roll up their sleeves and they'll work with you. And I can always be found through them. So uh, if you uh, would require maybe some menu review or further menu work on your own, the SBDC is certainly the place to go and they can reach out to me and I can sit in on that meeting uh, if you request. Okay. And, uh... And you're, we'll do this again next Tuesday, right, Chris? Absolutely. I hope to get to see you all then. Okay. Well, if you haven't registered, uh, please go on our website, click on the link, register, and we'll see you all next week. Have a great rest of the day. All right. Thanks, Chris. Bye.